In this video lecture, we're going to talk about procedures. We're not going to cover everything related to procedures this week. We're just going to cover the foundational components that let us get working with them. And then we'll kind of finish out all the topics related to procedures when we move on to Python in this course. So let's get started. How do we define a procedure? A procedure is a series of programming instructions that are grouped together. And that's a pretty generic definition. But you're going to see that this concept is really powerful when, we, when it comes to writing programs. Procedures are usually given names, uh, and they may or may not require input to work. And we'll talk about what I mean by input to a procedure. Uh, procedures may or may not produce output, so we'll talk about what that means as well. Um, we've already worked with procedures in Visual Logic uh, because the intrinsic functions provided by the environment are actually procedures. And one thing I want to note is that the term procedure uh, is interchangeable with the term function. So sometimes I, I might slip in and call them functions, but I'm actually talking about procedures. So just kind of a note. So let's dive in a little bit to see what this means uh, and, and how these things are helpful in writing our programs. Make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This could be the really long name of a procedure. In fact, it's a procedure that maybe you yourself have carried out. Um, I am basically giving you a set of instructions. And those set of instructions are encapsulated by this sentence. In other words, what it means to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, this is kind of a definition of a more complex set of tasks that you're going to have to follow out. Make PBJ, right? So we have a series of instructions grouped together and given a name. A lot of the instructions are implied. And chances are whoever taught you to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, uh, if you've ever made one, is the person that uh, are the set of instructions you're now thinking about when I say make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, but again, that one sentence kind of implies or, or uh, that there are a lot of steps that we need to take. So we'll talk about this. Um, we may consider the input to this system as bread, peanut butter, and jelly. Uh, and we also may consider that the output of this uh, system is a sandwich. So something like making a sandwich provides us with a grouped set of instructions uh, with some potential for input and output. So let's think about this a little bit more. Uh, so originally I said the procedures let us be concise. It's way easier to tell someone, hey, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich than it is to say, Go to the kitchen, get out a loaf of bread, open the bread, take out two slices, close the bread and put it away. Now get a jar of peanut butter and open it. Get a jar of jelly and open it. Get a knife and use it to spread the peanut butter and jelly on the bread. And when you're done, take the knife and put it in the sink and then take the, the lids and put them back on the peanut butter and jelly jars. Take the peanut butter and jelly and put them away. Take the two slices of bread, put one on top of the other. Maybe take the knife and cut them in half. You get the idea. It would be really difficult for humans to communicate if we didn't kind of have sentences that could condense these complex steps down into a simple, hey, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, and so one of the things that we're gonna get out of procedures is this ability to be concise. Uh, and that ability to be concise also lends itself to the next concept, which is that procedures can hide complexity. Um, you know, how many times has somebody said, hey, just make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Well, if you've never made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, that, that might be a complex process for you. You don't know how to do it. Um, so you realize at that moment, hey, or if, or if it's say, hey, change a flat tire on a car. If no one's ever shown you or you've never done it, that simple sentence, change the flat tire on your car, becomes a really complex process that may be stressful in a given situation. Um, so we have these sentences or these statements uh, that, that again, hide the complexity of very complex systems. So something that we've used is the random uh, intrinsic function. And one of the things that's nice about this idea of hiding complexity is, well, how, how does random work? It doesn't matter. I have no idea. We could seek out some mathematical papers or some uh, white papers uh, related to pseudo random number generation research. And we could look at the math and figure out how they work, but we don't have to. We just know that, hey, if I say, hey, random intrinsic function, um, give me back a number, I get one back, right? I call the function and it gives me a random number uh, based upon, you know, the parameters that I provide it. So, um, you know, if you were the person who wrote the random procedure, then you would know how it works. Um, but in any other case, it really doesn't matter, right? Like you don't need to be a mechanic to drive a car. It can be helpful. 
but um, and uh, if you built the car, you'd obviously have a lot more knowledge of how that system works. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we have this ability to encapsulate complex processes behind a procedure. Um, and, and one of the things that's kind of unique about this idea of hiding complexity is most of the time as a student, you're the one writing the code. So a lot of times students say, well, why, why would I not know what a procedure does? But think about things like make array and think about things like random and some of the other intrinsic functions we've used. Um, those are things that have been written for you. And so you don't need to necessarily understand how they work. And if you were to write some procedures and give them to some friends to use in their code, um, they wouldn't necessarily need to understand how those procedures work um, because you're the one who wrote them. And that's kind of a nice thing that one programmer could do for another is, is help write code that's, that's uh, helpful to others when they write their code uh, and helps them kind of free up their brain cycles uh, so that they don't have to focus on, on rewriting uh, those specific aspects that you've already written. So again, we use these things every day without you know, this concept of hiding complexity behind these simple statements uh, and this ability for us to use complex machinery uh, without not necessarily understanding how they function internally. This is kind of a, a funny statement I often tell to students has proved to me that in uh, an automated teller machine, uh, a money machine, um, you know, is that there's really just not like a person or uh, a hamster sitting inside of that machine that takes your card and hands you cash. You can't, right? You provide that system with some input, your card and a PIN number, and hopefully you get the right amount of cash out. You know, that whole system is a black box to you. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of complexity in terms of communication between different banks and accounts. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't really know how or care how that, that machine works. Uh, we just know that we do what we're supposed to do and it works. So procedures uh, let us reuse code, uh, which is really nice too. So this idea of that not only do they hide complexity, uh, but they let us you know, write code one time and then reuse that code multiple times in our code. This means we don't have to copy and paste code from one part of our program to another. Oftentimes copying and pasting code is a good sign that your solution to the problem could be improved. Uh, unless it's Friday at five o'clock and you just wanna go home, you should never, ever, ever copy and paste code from one part of your code base uh, to another. Um, this is where you wanna start thinking about how do I abstract this out or how do I take this code and put it into a procedure? Because what happens is if you have the same code in multiple spots in your program and you need to change it, well, then you need to remember that you have to go back and change that code in multiple places. And again, that becomes a burden on you to have to like keep a list of these things or do a find and replace. And what if you miss one? There might be an error where something is calculated correctly in one place but not in another. Let's say, for example, sales tax uh, calculations could be um, put behind a procedure uh, and the sales tax changes. You know, if, and and uh, if it's in a procedure, it's very easy to make that change because we can write reusable blocks of code. So again, just like we can use random and we can use make array over and over and over again without knowing how they work, we also know that um, should we ever need to make, you know, should the uh, person who wrote those functions make changes to them, we would get that for free because, you know, you know, if your ATM machine was updated from hamsters that hand out cash to robots, well, you know, that's great as long, you know, as long as that machine keeps operating the same way as it did previously, you don't care, you know, even if the bank made it more efficient. Uh, but this idea is that we can make one change and it gets reflected across our entire program by using procedures. Um, so it's awesome. Changing code in one place is great. Probably the most important thing that procedures do is they let us decompose a problem. And I don't want to be cliche, but I, I'm going to be. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that phrase, uh, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is, jokingly, one bite at a time. And this cliche kind of comes back to us because what it essentially is trying to say is, you know, you see in front of you this extremely big, hard to solve problem. And when you look at that problem as a whole, it looks and is a very difficult problem to tackle. Uh, but if you can take that problem and break it into smaller pieces and focus intently on those smaller pieces, and as you kind of uh, complete each small piece in turn, what you'll find is that by completing smaller pieces, you're eventually going to achieve that greater whole or that bigger problem or bigger program that you're trying to write, and it doesn't seem as daunting. So by tackling small pieces of your program uh, and then chaining those small pieces together into a bigger program, uh, it makes it easier to write software. It makes it easier to debug. It makes it easier to think through. So instead of saying, you know, how do I write an ATM machine? Uh, you could think of one piece. Okay, how do I accept a user's PIN number? 
And once you write that code, you can say, okay, now that I have the pin number, how do I go ahead and verify that the pin number is valid, right? And you might find that for some of these things, you might need to break them down further. You know, earlier on when I was talking about uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? Um, you know, you'll note that I was still giving higher level instructions that, that a human could understand. So something like go, you know, get a jar of peanut butter. Um, you know, in most cases, you can't tell a robot to do that. You would need to say, hey, from your current location, turn to the left 90 degrees, move forward five inches, take your articulated arm and move it at this angle, at this rate of speed, up to this specific point using this arc of movement. You know, use your pincer to grasp this cabinet with this amount of pressure, right? Like, depending on how we're dealing with the problem, the idea of how far we decompose a problem, and you know, in other words, what are those tiny pieces that we need to build? Um, you know, do you, do you need to break down a problem into these really, 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 you know, you know, almost like grains of sand level, or is it okay to kind of, you know, work at a little rougher, uh, higher level where you've got a slightly bigger problem? So what it means to break a problem down into smaller pieces um, really depends on the problem, really depends on your comfort level with the code um, that you're writing, and it's one of those things that, that, that really, as a programmer, you, you spend your whole life really trying to really trying to tackle. Um, some people might say there's a hard limit on the number of lines of code or the amount of code that should be in a pr uh, procedure, but um, the really reality is it's going to be dependent on the problem you're solving and the project you're working on. The formal term for breaking a problem down, decomposing a problem into smaller pieces is structured design. And this idea of, you know, this class, one of the big things that we discuss from a computational thinking uh, point of view is how do we break big complex problems down into manageable small chunks and structure those chunks in a way that, that help me achieve a bigger end. Earlier on, I said that procedures can accept inputs. Those inputs in this specific case are going to be called parameters. And parameters are going to allow us to pass information into a procedure. So just like an ATM machine allows me to pass in my card and my PIN number, we're going to go ahead and write procedures that allow us to pass in any number of parameters that we want. Anywhere from zero, no parameters, all the way up to, you know, whatever the upper bound is. There's always a limit, but I don't know what it is. So we can think of it almost as unlimited. A good example of this that we've used already is the make array function. So this intrinsic function in visual logic accepts two parameters. So it's a function, it's a procedure. It requires two things to do its work. It requires a name, so we have to give it a name of the array, and it needs an upper bound. So it requires a string and an integer. And those procedures, or sorry, those parameters to the procedure are necessary so that it has the appropriate input to do the work it needs to do. Um, if you don't tell, you know, the procedure needs all of the information it needs to complete its work. Otherwise, it, it can't do the work. So, um, that's something to think about. So we're going to be able to pass in these things called parameters, and we'll see how they're defined. Uh, and again, you can pass as many of these in as you need, or none whatsoever. The book is going to use this term, these two terms, formal versus actual parameters. Uh, and so the parameters that we define when writing a procedure are going to be called formal parameters. And these are essentially going to be placeholders. If we think about our procedures as a standalone program, uh, what we're going to find is that, um, you know, a really good example is any program can use the random function. Any program can use the make array function. Uh, so what we want to do is make sure that when we write our procedures that they can be reused across multiple programs. And what we don't want is, is people who use our functions to have to use very specific variable names to, to call them. So parameters, formal parameters, are a way for us to create some variables. Um, and these will be the parameters that are passed in. And any value the user passes into our procedure will get stored into these formal parameters. And so you can think of them as a box or, you know, sometimes I think of them as like a rail car, uh, you know, like, like maybe uh, that uh, might be used in an, an adventure movie or in a mining operation. But this idea that uh, basically we're going to, the user is going to put the values into the function via its parameters. Uh, and then the function will uh, know those values internally by their formal parameter names. And we'll see how this works when we get to the actual examples moving forward. But again, formal parameters are a way for us to define variables inside of a procedure that only exist inside of the procedure and allow users to pass data into our procedure. Um, and then we can utilize them uh, by, by, by passing in any value or using any variable name outside of the procedure. Uh, but inside the procedure, they have a very formal name that we can, as the writer of the procedure, um, use those values.
So I know it's a lot, it's a little bit confusing, but once you see how this works, it, it's a little bit easier to understand. So this idea is that uh, we're gonna be able to allow users to pass things in, uh, and those items will be held in our formal parameters. Uh, the items that the user is passing in externally are gonna be called the actual parameters, because that's the things that the user is actually putting in. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, and it'll make a little bit more sense when we get to the coding uh, piece. Oh, you know what? One quick example about this. If we were writing an ATM machine, uh, or building ATM machines, to keep using this example, um, I, have, I have an ATM card, you have an ATM card, millions of people have ATM cards. Those are your ATM card and my ATM card. They are unique to the individual who owns them. But the ATM machine needs to be built in a way that it's generic to work with all cards. So inside of the ATM machine, it just might say card, right? The user puts in a card or a pin, okay? That is the concept of a formal parameter. The machine just knows it as a card. But the actual parameter, the thing being put into the machine is my card or your card or my pin number or your pin number, all right? So the formal parameter is how the internals know of the item. Uh, the actual value is how you or I know of the item that's being passed into the system. A couple of notes. Uh, in terms of simplifying procedures, we're only going to focus on these core concepts for right now. We're going to look only focus on creating procedures uh, and passing in parameters uh, and this, these concepts of formal versus actual parameters. A couple things that I'm skipping right now to help kind of you know make sure that this uh, topic doesn't get too overwhelming uh, that we'll get to when we get uh, start working with Python is a concept called variable scope. In other words, this idea of where you declare variables has uh, an impact on what parts of your code can see those variables. Uh, and that concept is not really easily dealt with uh, in visual logic in a way that I, I think is very clear. Additionally, when we get to Python, we'll start talking a little more about this idea of passing values into a procedure via uh, reference or via value. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about that and probably come, to, come back to visual logic at that point in time as well. Uh, but there's there's a couple of items. Uh, additionally, we're also not talking about returning values from our procedures. So these are some things that we'll we'll uh, uh, you know skip for right now and come back to later. So again, just focusing on creating procedures, using them in our code, uh, and passing parameters into them so that they can do some work.